Look, who's that girl? Oh, Claudette Colvin. When she was 15, she refused to give up her seat to a white woman in 1955. Why did she have to give up her seat? It was the law. And if you were black, you had to sit at the back of the bus or be forced to give up your seat for white passengers simply because they were white. The coloured area was marked to make sure they knew their place. However, whites were allowed to sit in the back section if no more seats were up in the front. If the seats were filled behind the marker and vacant in front, blacks were still not allowed to cross over to those seats. Segregation was in effect in churches, buses and schools. You couldn't even go into the same restaurant. That's a horrible. Claudette Colvin made a stand against entrenched segregation nine months before Rosa Parks did. But few people know the story of Claudette Colvin as the moment was overshadowed. She was a bright, curious child who quickly caught on to the racial divisions that were playing for all to see. With the visual and verbal signs apparent throughout the city to keep blacks in their lane. Before we begin to tell you more, don't forget to like and subscribe to keep up to date when we release new videos. Colvin was born in September 1939 and raised by her great aunt and uncle in rural Pine Level, Alabama. Before moving to Montgomery, she said her only interaction with white people was when she left her aunt and uncle's farm to go to the local store to pick up supplies. That's where she began to understand racism. Age 8, she moved to Montgomery, the low-income black neighbourhood of King Hill. At school, she was encouraged to engage significantly with black citizens' issues. She learned about the Meow Meow Uprising in Kenya. She was taught literature by Edgar Allan Poe, her favourite author and black poet such as Paul Lawrence Dunbar. One of the benefits of attending an all-black school was the exposure to a black-focused curriculum. In 1952, her neighbour and classmate Jeremiah Reeves, who was just 16, was sentenced to death by an all-white jury for the attack of a white woman. Reeves had withdrawn a confession made under jurist and was later executed. His death prompted the intervention of the National Association for the Advancement of Coloured People. The case of Jeremiah Reeves angered Colvin. He was so young and had aspirations of being a jazz drummer. Reeves' case was the first time Colvin had seen the NAACP in action. In the days prior to her refusing to give up her seat, she was given an essay assignment by her teacher during what was the Negro History Week. The essay's title was, How Do You Feel as an American? The title of the assignment instantly struck her. We weren't considered Americans, she says, anger still pulsating through her words. We were considered as Negroes. Colvin rejoined the NAACP Youth Council and embraced her natural hair in defiance of the pressures to have it straightened. Feeling even more impassioned, after learning about black heroes like Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth, she was more than ready to make her mark on history. On March 2nd, 1955, Colvin was riding the bus home from school when standard order came from the driver to leave a row of seats to accommodate a white woman who just boarded the bus. Three of her classmates stood up, but Colvin didn't budge. Colvin would say in an interview with the BBC, Whenever people ask me, why didn't you get up when the bus driver asked you? I say it felt as though Harriet Tubman's hand were pushing me down on one shoulder, and Sojourner Truth's hand were pushing me down on the other. I felt inspired by these women because my teacher taught us about them in so much detail. The bus driver flagged down two officers who soon boarded the bus. Aggressively grabbing her off the bus and handcuffing her in the back of her police car, she faced three charges. Disturbing the peace, breaking segregation law and assaulting a police officer. The court dropped in the first two, but the assault charge stayed. Instead of being taken to a juvenile detention centre, Colvin was taken to an adult jail. She felt fearful as the heavy sound of her cell door being locked. And she sat down alone in a tiny space, crying and praying until her mother and the family pastor arrived to bail her out a few hours later. Colvin's dilemma caught the attention of local black leaders, who obviously called the legal representation that led to most of the charges being dropped. The leaders initially considered using her example as justification for a city-wide bus boycott, but they felt she was not the right fit. 
They thought she was too young to serve as the rallying figure for what was sure to be a turbulent movement. When it was revealed that Colin was pregnant later that summer, it seemingly reinforced the sentiment that they felt that she was the wrong person for the moment. An unwed pregnant teenager. Who will talk more about the pregnancy than the boycott? At the time, the NAACP and the other black organisations felt Rosa Parks made a better icon for the movement than a teenager. Rosa, who was 42 years old at the time, working as a seamstress and NAACP secretary, made her own headlines when she was arrested on December 1st after refusing to get up her seat in a similar fashion. This prompted the launch of Montgomery bus boycott the following day. Colvin was approached by Parks for a short while. The two became close, with Colvin occasionally staying at Parks' home. Colvin was left mainly to handle the consequence of her actions alone in the community until around two months into the Montgomery bus boycott. She was pulled back into the conflict when civil rights attorney Fred Gray approached her about a civil lawsuit that would become the Bridal Regal case. This federal lawsuit challenged the constitutionality of Montgomery's segregation laws. Colvin was one of the four plaintiffs alongside three other women, Oriella Browder, Susie McDonald and Mary Lou Smith, who experienced similar mistreatment on a bus. Colvin was just 16 when she took the stand. She faced harsh cross-examination by the city's right attorney, Walter Nabe, but emerged as the star witness among four lead plaintiffs. The city's legal strategy had essentially been to defame the bus boycott as an orchestrated act of subversion directed by outside influences, namely Martin Luther King. A few judge panel ruled in their favour and found that the bus segregation was unconstitutional under the 14th Admin, which states the following. The US Supreme Court upheld the decision in November, which gave legal teeth to the resident and ultimately made the Bow Court successful. The landmark case effectively ended segregation on buses in 1956. Despite her considerable contributions to the cause, life in Alabama was still tricky for Colvin, still shoddy by local leaders in the black community while enjoying the racism of the South. This led to her abandoning her dreams of becoming a civil rights attorney and in her early 20s moved to New York, becoming a nursing assistant and decided to remain there for good after Martin Luther King's assassination in 1968. Coffin's story mainly remained unknown for decades, an anonymous figure in the massive city of New York. She worked in a Manhattan nursing home until her retirement in 2004. Reports surrounding the events of her arrest and involvement in the case came out in bits and pieces until New York Governor Mario Cuomo awarded her the MLK Junior Medal of Freedom in 1990. In 2009, she was the subject of Philip Hughes' Claudette Colvin, twice toward justice, which won a National Book Award. March 2nd is known as Claudette Colvin Day in Montgomery, and the city unveiled granite markers to commemorate Colvin and her three co plaintiffs in late 2019. After a petition from Miss Colvin, an Alabama judge ordered her criminal records to be destroyed on November 2021. It seems more recognition is finally coming for the overlooked hero. He helped set the wheels of a new era in motion. Thank you for watching till the end. If you like this video, please don't forget to give us a like, comment your thoughts below and share with others.